Welcome to the Infinite Wealth Podcast. I'm Cameron Christensen, along with our co-host, Anthony Faso. We just wrapped up our interview with David Chavez. He is a strategic coach and owner of Assured Strategies. And, man, he had some really good insight on some of the coaching techniques that they use. Anthony, what are some of your takeaways you had? Well, for one, with this one, with this podcast or this interview, it, it, we ended up having such great content that we're breaking it up into two. Yeah. This first one is about goal setting. The second one's going to be about delegating. So in regards to goal setting, I, tell you, I think that that's, that's very important. Mm -hmm. And what I think, a lot of times people know that, but they don't, I don't think they really know it deep inside, right? And a, a great video that Stephen Covey did was he, he, he had somebody come in and they had all these rocks, right? these big rocks, and the big rocks um, reference something big, like your relationships, like your, you know, your children, you know, your financial security, all these big stuff. And then there was these smaller rocks, Right. And he challenged somebody to put them. They had a bucket of big rocks and a bucket of small ro uh, rocks. And they challenged them to try to put them all in the bucket together. And I don't want to give up the segue, uh, the uh, punchline, but it, it just shows how important it is that we put what's important first. Mm -hmm. Like I know for me, if I need to do a few things in a day or a month, I'm going to do the things that I enjoy doing. Yeah. Right. It's not the ones that are most important, but goal setting is going to help you um, make sure that you're working on you're working on what is important. And an example of how important goal settings are is like I had a client. We were just talking about they were they were taking the money from the, for the CARES Act from their 401k. Right, put it into a policy, and then we started talking about. Uh, she mentioned that she was going to continue to fund her uh, her four hundred one k. And then I, I started asking, okay, you know, when we first met, we went over your goals, and your goals was to get out of debt, to buy a rental property, to be able to pay, uh, help support your son, her son's education. So my question was, okay, putting that money in your 401k, is that going to help you achieve your goals? Good question. And so th when you know where you want to go, that can help you whenever you get in a fork in the road, look at your goals and that'll tell you where you want to go and thus that'll tell you which fork in the road to take. Cam, what, what stood out or what takeaways did you have? Yeah, I like the questions that uh, that he was asking uh, along the goal setting line. Um, what I took away was, at one point, he was talking about working on your business versus working in your business, and the way that I kind of understood mm. that was, as a business owner, you kind of keep this thing moving, right? You show up every day, every week, and you're pushing this thing along. And if something a, a problem or a situation arises, is you address it and you try to move on pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I. When he was talking about that, I had this idea of triage, right? As a business owner, you're like, hey, I got to you know, I gotta handle this because it's a bigger priority mm -hmm. than that. Mm -hmm. And when he was talking about uh, goals and goal setting, he went through this smart sheet with us. And in that smart sheet, he kind of um, held it up and we started going through it. And he said, hey, if somebody, when, when a business owner looks at this, they think that they can go through this in maybe five or 10 minutes. I tell you, when I saw that, I'm like, yeah, I, I got that. Exactly. Right? I could knock this out yeah. in, you know, in a half hour or whatever, rip pretty easily. But he said, you know, what ends up happening is somebody ends up spending about a week just on this one worksheet, filling in the questions, some obstacles that may arise and those things. And what, what stood out to me was, I mean, I can't remember the last time that I spent, you know, a week literally thinking about the business and some of the problems that were in there and thinking of solutions. And so just to have somebody come in and slow you down and to bring these things to kind of the top of the surface to address them, I can only imagine uh, he shared with us some of the progress that uh, some of his clients had made, and I can only imagine um, how successful that uh, somebody would be with that kind of help. So I was impressed by his questions. Great. Now, we had a lot of fun going into about goals. As you'd mentioned, he, he referred to a, a couple of PDFs mm -hmm. that, that can help guide you to not only write down the goal, but more importantly, 
talk about how you're going to accomplish that and what obstacles are going to come into play. So if you know that ahead of time, when you get that obstacle, you, 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 you already have a plan on what to do. So those PDFs, they're, we can't put them exactly in the show notes in, on, uh, for the podcast, but we do turn the podcast into a blog. So in the blog, we are able to put those PDFs. So there will be a link to our blog from the podcast. And also, he does share his screen a couple times, but, but don't worry. He, he orally describes what we're doing. So I don't think it's – you're still going to be able to learn by just listening. However, we do record all these on YouTube. Mm -hmm. So if you want to watch it on YouTube, it will be there as well. Awesome. I think you're going to enjoy this episode. Take care. David, thanks for joining our podcast. We are excited to have you on. All right. Well, thank you, Anthony. I'm glad to be on with you guys. You know, one of the first things we want to talk about is uh, if you wouldn't mind sharing your, your story. You started off in the Army or maybe even a little bit before, but you've kind of had a very interesting uh, path that you have been on till, till now. You mind giving us some uh, detail behind that? Yeah. Do you want me to start before the army or after or at, during the army or what do you want me to do? Wherever you want, whatever, okay. whatever you feel like. All right. So, so I, I was born and raised um, in Las Vegas. So I've been here pretty Ooh. much all my life. Um, and my, actually my grandfather came here in 1919. So when there's about 10,000 people here, so we've been here for a long time. Um, and uh, I, I, after high school, I went into the Army. Um, I served in the Army for four years over in Germany when the wall was still up. Mm. Um, so, matter of fact, came down about nine months after I left in late um, in 1989, and I left in late 1988. Um, I was an artillery sergeant, so what we did is we um, shot cannons and... Mm. Um, but I had, a, I had a pretty fun job, the last job I was in, because we used to fly around um, with uh, special rounds that did special things. Mm. And so when, once we shot them out of our cannon, the canyon was destroyed. So, uh, um, but but um, it, was, it was all unnecessary in the end because the strong defense helped protect us and the wall came down. So it all worked out the right way. Came, while I was in the army, I started going to college and um, went to the um, uh, city colleges of Chicago. Had um, classes that they offered in Europe at a lot of the bases, and I took received my associate's degree, and then came back and finished up at UNLV and got, um, received my bachelor's degree. Uh, got an offer from Arthur Anderson. Um, went to work with Arthur Anderson for five years. During that time, gaming was exploding throughout the uh, country. So we were doing a lot of IPOs. Um, matter of fact, I worked on five during the years I was there. And it was just a um, really rewarding time. Worked a lot of hours, but learned a lot. I would say in those five years, I tell people I probably gained 10 years of experience. One of the last things I did, though, the, one of the very last things I did was work on the strategic plan that split Hilton Gaming from Hilton Hotels. And mm. so uh, splitting those two properties up, got to meet Baron Hilton. Um, and that was sort of interesting. Then I went on and uh, went to work for a wealthy family here in town called the Greenspun family. I um, took care of all their personal finances, money, um, as well as their, their company money. And then um, sort of sat in boards, uh, board meetings for them. I represented all the family and all the meetings that were happening. So I was like the family representative, um, bought and sold companies for them, uh, worked for them for about a year, a little over a year, and then started my own CPA firm, grew it um, and sold it in uh, 2007. Um, and it's it was an interesting time right before everything crashed. Mm. Um, didn't do anything really that substantive during that time. I was a deal I was working on, a reverse merger that I was working on. It was a $100 million buyout of a company. We finished that up. And then I didn't know really what to do. So I started, uh, I used the scaling up system in my own company and um, 
got online to just download some tools and find out what was going on uh, so I could sort of figure out what was next for me. And when I got on, they were looking for coaches. I had no idea what a coach was at the time. And um, I, I, it's from that point, I started coaching and I've been coaching for 12 years now. And what I do is I help companies, mostly in the mid-market, smaller companies, but also mid-market companies, help them scale and grow their company to the next level. Usually I start, um, me personally, our firm starts working with clients right at about 500,000 to a million. And then, um, but me personally, I work with companies probably at about 10 to 20 million and on up. And what we're really doing is helping them to the next level of strategy. A lot of companies start off with a lot of operational efficiency and then they get it, they, they plateau in their growth. And then we help them get through that to that next level. So. Well, first, I'm just going to ask this on behalf of Cameron because I know he's going to kick himself. He doesn't ask. So where I, during, with the experience that you had with the Hiltons, right, you met the dad. <laughs> he wants to know if you met Paris. I did not meet Paris. I'm sorry. Right. Sorry, Cameron. Cameron. I, I, it's disappointing, I know. And you want to know where I met Baron Hilton, don't you? In the yeah, bathroom. <laughs> Okay. We'll, we'll save that story for another time. Yeah. Let's move along. <laughs> well, Dave, you left one very important piece out, and maybe the most important piece of your... Oh, when I met you. Yes. Okay. So <laughs> uh, I didn't even need to... You're right. Uh, I met David. David taught a CPA pre pepper prep course. Okay. Yep. I mean, 16 weeks. I remember going there two nights from like from like six to ten or something like that. We had homework every week, and I remember every week Dave would ask, "All right, who did the homework?" Every week <laughs> I had every week I had my uh, my hand up. But uh, so from there, David and I became friends, and he's been a mentor to me and shared some. Uh, stories and some insight and um, he's a big Steelers fan but <laughs> but and it, he, he had mentioned that the scaling up uh, and that that's also a book called scaling up right mm -hmm. so we are it, it's a good book we we've read it we've actually we, we have incorporated some of those lessons in there into into our business even though ours is smaller there's still some great things that that big companies are doing that you can scale them to fit to, to fit the small companies almost definitely uh, I'll, I'll tell you that i use i don't use all the scaling up system because if i used it all it would overwhelm me because we're still we're still small ourselves but um um, you can start using the scaling up system as a small business, even as uh, I started using it when it was just me. So I started thinking about the approaches and putting a lot of things together. So you, there's a lot you can use right out of the gate. You just don't want to use too much of it because it can really overwhelm you if you're small. So, gotcha. but it does help you get closer to understanding what you're really doing and developing and you could do that development at a smaller size instead of a larger size. When you're doing it at a larger size, it takes longer to turn the ship than mm -hmm. it does when you're smaller. So if you get these things on board at an early, early time, um, it could really be helpful. We have a group of small businesses that meet once a month here in Las Vegas, and it's comprised of several small businesses. So if anybody's interested in that, they just give our office a call, and I'll talk to them about joining the group. And what we do is we focus on strategy during those once a month meetings and developing our strategy inside of our company, looking at our business model, the way that we're delivering. And there's some pretty interesting companies in there that, that we all get together once a month. Hmm. Interesting. That is interesting. <laughs> David, you mentioned a, a couple of things as you're going through your kind of story there as you've kind of started off in, in the military, right? You came out as an employee. And then you became kind of self-employed as a business consultant. Is uh, what do you think has been some of the things that helped you attribute, uh, or some of the attributes you've had that have helped you achieve success in all those different roles? Because those, each of those roles uh, are very different skills. 
Yeah. Um, so there's a couple of things that happened to me that I didn't really talk about that much. So first of all, I had a little bit of a rough childhood. Anthony knows that I, I lived on the streets a little bit when I was a kid, just left home altogether. And then um, got the, uh, received the discipline in my life from the army. Um, that was one of the greatest gifts that was probably given to me and allowed me to do all the things that I've done. Um, and then the, one of the other things that I did after I got out of the army while I was actually going to college is I started working for Olin Mills Portrait Studios running phone sales rooms. And mm -hmm. so I learned how to sell really well. And um, in, I, I think I started like three months later, I was a manager. Nine months later, I was running Las Vegas. And then about six months after I started running Las Vegas, I had the highest sales area per capita in the United States. I was actually making over $100,000 a year when I graduated college. So it was very hard to go to $25,000 Arthur Anderson offered me after making $120,000 a year. So, well, you know, it, that's a very important decision that you made. And most people would say, if I'm making a hundred grand and you are much older than me, Dave. So a hundred grand back then, just teasing a hundred grand back then is more than what it is now. I, a lot of people would say, why even complete school? You made it. But um, so you, you continued working. And then when you did graduate, you took a 75% pay cut to work probably twice as hard and twice as many well, hours. Well, but, but I don't know. Um, I know Arthur Anderson is the ones who did the Enron audit. A lot of people look at Arthur Anderson in a very poor light, but there was a lot of media around what originally happened, but there wasn't a lot of media around how the government really lost their case against Arthur Anderson. Um, but Arthur Anderson was the number one accounting firm in the world. Um, getting an offer from Arthur Anderson out of college was like going to Harvard out of high school. Um, so I wasn't going to pass up growing up poor in the way I did. I wasn't passing up going to Harvard when the opportunity was there. So that's how I looked at it. It, it was, a, I know I could go back and make that money again anytime I wanted to. So if I failed over on the other side, the worst case scenario was going back and making 120,000 a year selling. So. Okay. So just clear. So back then, Arthur Anderson, Harvard, that means Price Waterhouse might have been Stanford or Yale. But anyway, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. <laughs> well, I'm just saying back then, I know some yeah. of the firms have come up a little bit. So I think Price Waterhouse or KPMG or whatever it's called now is probably up at the top, if I'm not mistaken now. You know what? It is, but who cares? Like, it doesn't matter. Like, I don't own any of it, you know, but it just, it just sounds good on the That's resume. Correct. Right? That's correct. But, 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 you know, I, I think the best thing about being a CPA, um, I don't enjoy, it, it's really interesting when I talk to people and they talk to me about being a CPA, they think I'm very numbers, bean counter. They don't understand that in public accounting, you do le very little bean counting. Uh, matter of fact, you don't really do any. Um, it's more about probably 80% of what we did on a day-to-day -day basis was communication. So... Um, it's for selling for my background in selling, it actually was easy for me. So, because I was used to talking to people, I was used to asking them questions. So those things all came easy to me. Great. So we're going to talk about goals. Okay. And wh why are goals important? <laughs> Well, I think goals are important because um, if you don't have goals, you realizing what you're trying to accomplish goes from 8% to 92%. So because when people use goals, they're more likely to accomplish what they're setting out to accomplish. And so what, what you want to use goals for are the things that you can't compromise on not getting done. Okay, so we use it a lot in the scaling up system. We use goals. Um, we actually call them rocks. Comes from the the Covey video. What are the big things that need to go in before the pebbles go in? If you've ever watched that video, 
or ever read any of the uh, read the seven habits of highly effective teams um, it's what are the big things that really need to get done that if we don't have goals those things get ate up by all the little day-to-day -day activities that take away our time and we never really get to the big items that really need to be addressed. So goals should be something um, that I'm, some next level I'm trying to attain um, and really trying to get to, and I need structure and dedication to get there. Okay, that's how I look at goals. Great point is uh, we actually just did a podcast recently and we talked about kind of different quadrants, mm -hmm. right? And uh, really what we we're talking about was somebody that's self-employed or the specialist. And uh, what we talked about is um, kind of you own a job, right? And the job is you, right? So a lot of times you become that commodity that, you're, that is being sold. And so what you were just talking about, what I heard you say is, hey, the goals are important because what that does is it, it helps you work on the business, not in the business, right? It kind of removes you from that and keeps the ship moving forward, which is helping somebody transition from that self-employed specialist kind of quadrant over to potentially a big business uh, quadrant that we're hoping to get where we've got systems and stuff in place. Would you agree yeah, with that? Uh, do, do you mind if I share the screen? So, Cause I want to no. talk about what you're talking about real quick. Perfect. Yeah, please do. Yeah. Um, I, I, I need your permission now from you. All right, perfect. Dave, right, so, I think that's the first time you've ever said, uh, you've ever asked me for permission for anything. You just kind of take over. <laughs> now, well, if, I can't take over. Pod, right? If you're on the podcast, you listen to on your drive, you're not going to be able to see the visual. However, oh, we okay. will, we are posting this on YouTube. And I believe that there, if there's a PDF or such, we're, we're going to try to have a link so you can. Yeah, this was just this was just a slide from a slideshow that I I have. So, um, but but um, if if you uh, let me just to get this up real quick, I I still can't show. You guys got to allow me to. Okay, you know I really just wanted to make you to ask twice. <laughs> okay, so thank I you. Try now. <laughs> it's okay. All right, so here's this slide, and I'll sort of walk you through it as I'm uh, I'm I'm sharing it with. Um, the two of you, let me just get the slide up. All right. Um, all right, so here it is. All right, so there's 28 million firms in the United States. This was a study that was done by the SBA, and 96% of these companies never get over a million dollars. And the, a question I like to ask entrepreneurs is why do you think 96% of the companies never get over a million dollars. So I'll ask the two of you and maybe you understand what it is. I would, I would say just to follow up from what I just said is that uh, most, most small business owners have that mentality that if something needs to get done, it needs to be done. I'm going to do it myself. Uh, so love, love it, Cameron. And you're hitting it right on the head. It's control. We're control freaks. Yep. Entrepreneurs are control freaks by definition, right? I mean, that's what makes a great entrepreneur is the yeah, control, mm -hmm. right? And so how do we get ourselves out of this control mindset? Because only 4% of the entrepreneurs get over a million dollars, only 0.4 get over 10 million. And so why do only 0.4 of 1% only get over 10 million? Again, now I have the same problem, but I have a leadership team that's controlling everything. Okay. And so that results in 50 million firms being over, uh, only 17,000 firms being over 50 million. Now, this SBA study is a little bit dated, but I just looked up not too long ago how many firms are over 50 million, and it was 34,000. So 34,000 firms in the United States or companies made it over 50 million out of the millions and millions of companies that are out there. So that, that visual really helps you see what you may have not otherwise seen. So, and, and just why do companies not scale? It's because the owner becomes obsessed with perfection. And if I'm going to scale a company, 
I want perfection, but I want to get as close to perfection without hindering my growth. Uh, uh, I, I like that. And I was going to try to tie in the goal setting piece that we just kind of led into that is what's the formula that you used to grow companies for the, or is there a formula that you use for the goal setting piece to it? Yeah. Yeah. So um, when we're setting goals, okay. So if I'm a sole pri- proprietor, or I'm a sole um, owner of a company and I really want to scale my company and I'm really sort of stuck of where I go, I should maybe set three to five goals for myself. Now we have learned since there's been a lot of um, psychology work done on businesses over the last 25 years. And there's been a lot of learning about human behavior inside of companies. And so we've learned that things that come in threes are more likely to be done than things that come in five, 10, 20. When I meet most entrepreneurs, uh, um, like businesses like our size, you know, I'm a little bit bigger than you guys, but we're all about the same size. We're in the same small business category. Um, wh- when I talk to business owners about this, what they do is they want to have 475 priorities. And what those are, are the little things that need to be done. And so there's a great story that was told that's told that that's told in circles about a Charles Schwab when he owned Bethlehem Steel out of Allentown, Pennsylvania. When he owned Bethlehem Steel, he hired a guy um, to come over and to help him figure out what's the matter with this company. The guy spent the day with him, um, um, went back to Charles Schwab at the end of the day, and he said, "Hey, you have great managers. They have great to-do lists." There's like 20 items on the list. They pulled them out constantly looking at them, was following up with what was going on. The problem is they're working on 20 things at one time. Just stop and have them work on one till it is done. And when it's done, they can move to the next one. And so Charles Schwab said, hey, what do I owe you? And the guy's name was Ivy Lee, by the way. Um, He said, so what do I owe you? The guy said, hey, don't worry about it. You just pay me what you think I'm worth. Three months later, he sent them a check for $27,000. Now, Anthony and I are CPA, so we can't can't have that in our mind without present valuing the money back to today. So that's about $3 million. So he paid him $3 million for one day. That's the value he received in a three-month time frame from that simple advice. And his simple advice was, get one thing really done. And it's really interesting, while I'm scaling and growing my firm right now, I have people on my own team that keep on saying things are done and they're not done. Things aren't done until they're done. Not 90% done, done. And so what goals really do is help you get things done because you don't realize the goal until the outcome is realized. And so that's why you really want to have really clear and concise goals. And I do have a methodology for developing those. Great. Okay, so, What's that book? Is it called The One Thing? Mm-hmm. Right. Have you read that book? Um, I did read the book. I, I, um, that book is a little bit off of that same concept. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so it, yeah, it's a great book to actually read and get the idea of the one thing. Yes. Yeah. Perfect. Great. Yep. And, and it's also in the scaling up book. We call it the one thing we call our critical number. What's the one number I really want to change inside of my company this quarter. And so our goal setting set up on a quarterly basis all the time. You could do it on a monthly basis. If you're a smaller company, I think monthly works a little bit better than quarterly. So because month, uh, in a smaller company, things are shifting too much. Mm-hmm. And for a quarter of time, that's a long time. And we're a little more flexible on whether we can get things done or not. So you're going to share that formula. Yep, yep. So I actually have a a form. I'll actually walk you guys through it. And so if you're listening to it, I'll make sure I cover the listening part too. All right. So um, here's, oh, I can't share again. You you could ask permission again. (laughs) Anthony, can I have permission? Intentionally shut that off. (laughs) 
I'm Speaking not. of control freaks. Oh, yeah. No, 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 no doubt. We're trying now. Perfect. All right. Here we go. So, so we use a formula called being smart with X to Y to win by win. And so this is the acronym SMART. Many people have heard of this acronym. I'll go over it as I'm going through this. But really, the way we want to think about it, and we get this from the book 40X, okay? It's the four disciplines of execution, okay? And so this is X to Y by when. So I'm at point X, and I want to get to point Y, and I want to do it in this much time. So that's what we're really after is trying to figure out X to Y by when. And so I want to do it in a smart way. SMART stands for specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, time bound. Okay. So I want to get from X to Y by when. So what I want to start with is I want to start with why I'm doing this goal. So let me give you an example of this and I'll sort of walk you through it. So Let's say that I'm starting to hire employees and I keep on making mistakes and end up finding out I have to remove them and start over again, right? So something's not working correctly. And I could have a, a goal about how refining my hiring process. That could be my goal, okay? But I, it's, why is this important to me? Well, number one, I would actually write this out. I keep on making mistakes and hiring the wrong person. And so I spend two months training them and then I got to get rid of them. And I lost two months of time, the money I paid them, uh, the, the money and, and time I spent interviewing them. And I can't afford that as a small company. And so that could be my purpose. It's costing me a small fortune. I've gone through two different people now and neither one of them worked out, right? So, so, so that's why the goal is important and that would go in this box right here in the A box. Then, what's my desired outcome? My desired outcome could be to hire the right person and understand that they're a good fit for my company. That could be the desired outcome. Now. This isn't probably the best measurement goal that I could make. In a more simple term, I'll just put it in context of like a, a personal goal. I could want to lose weight, okay? And so I, I want to lose 10 pounds. And so that's usually easier for people to get their arms around. Why do I want to do this? Because I'm starting to not fit in my clothes and I'm not feeling comfortable in my own skin. And I want to write these things out. And why do you want to write these things out is because that's the X. That's where you're at right now. It's the way you're feeling that is driving the desire to get the goal done. Okay. So once I get this done, then I can say the desire outcome to lose 10 pounds. Then I have to write the goal out. Okay. And so when I write a goal out, I want it to be smart. So when I write the goal out, I want to lose some weight. Okay, what are you going to do to lose weight? When are you going to get it done? How much are you going to lose? Um, all these questions come up. So when I actually write a goal out, I want to be smart about it. I want to go to the gym three times a week, eat a healthy diet six days a week, and, and work out at least five hours a week to get 10 pounds off. Now, specific. Yes, it's specific. I'm gonna lose 10 pounds by going to the gym three times a week, cutting my calories, uh, eating healthy six days a week, and then um, I said one other thing and I can't remember what it is, but um, maybe you guys could help me. Those would be the criteria of measurement. Mm -hmm. And it's very specific. There's no ambiguity in what I'm saying. Okay, then I get to the A, attainable. It's 10 pounds over a quarter, because I said I do all my goals in a quarter, mm -hmm. but even 10 pounds in a month wouldn't be unattainable if I was losing 10, eight the month before. 
Now, if I was gaining four pounds a month, and then I said I wanted to lose 10 pounds in one month, that's not really attainable. Do you understand? Yeah, it's 14. I'm going to swing 14 pounds in one month? I don't think so, right? Right. So we're, what, what, what people often do is they've heard of stretch goals before, but they don't understand how to use stretch goals. And stretch goals can be destructive if I stretch too far. And so attainability has to do with really attaining the actual goal. And then relevant, well, I actually took care of relevancy up here when I did why I'm doing the goal. Relevancy is my purpose for doing the goal, okay? And then time bound is, or timely, is the period of time that I'm going to get the goal over. So if it's this month, it would be starting November 1st, ending November 30th. And then my goal is smart because it has all those elements in it. Okay. Fantastic. I love it. It's great. Yep. Makes it really easy. I also like what you have on the bottom of that screen there, the obstacles. Yeah. Um, so once you get the goal written out, um, we usually tell people to do this in pencil, but we also have an electronic form that I'll share with you guys and you guys can share with your um, listeners. Um, you actually take this form and what you want to do is you want to think about what are the things that are going to stop me from doing this? Now, if you're like me, you like to have a beer every night, right? Um, beer may not be the best thing to lose 10 pounds with, mm -hmm. you, know, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So one of the obstacles would set be, could be, I like to have a beer every night. Okay. And then one of the things that could be happening to you, and I'm just going through my life journey, um, I like to eat snacks, high-carb snacks in the mm. evening. The kiss of death, right? Yeah. Right before you go to bed. So, Because all that sugar just plops down and then develops into fat instead mm -hmm. of your body burning it. And so, um, so obstacle number two would be I like to eat snacks. And so as you see, then we list out as many obstacles as we can. Then what we're going to actually do is sit down and think about what the strategy is I'm going to use to get over it. Like if I'm at home, quit buying beer could be the first one. <laughs> no, I'm not allowed to buy beer this month. And so I, I got to get rid of the beer in my house. I can't buy any. The second thing is I like to eat snacks at night. Get rid of all the snacks in the house and then padlock on the, the, the uh, refrigerator mm -hmm. and the padlock won't let me open it till 6 o'clock in the, in the morning, tomorrow morning. You know, that what you want to do is start to get strategies to overcome. So you go back to the uh, – um, um, you want to go back to the obstacle and say, what do I need to do to overcome this obstacle? Now, some of the obstacles may not happen right away. But what you want to do is you want to develop the strategy of obstacles you could see happening. And what ends up happening, because a lot of times why people stop working on goals is they hit an obstacle. And once they hit an obstacle, they don't know what to do to go forward. And so they hit that obstacle and then they stop working on the goal. If I already have the strategy to overcome the obstacle, then I just implement the strategy at that time and get back on my goal. And so awesome. there's no delay. Uh, that uh, yeah, I, I really like that piece right there that you just said. That's, uh, I think that's super important, just being kind of proactive and thinking uh, forward and saying, hey, if I do this, this is what's going to happen. A lot of people get that pushback and just stop regardless. Yeah, and then we, then we have like who has the authority and initiate – well, I could have a whole bunch of people in my life assigned authority to implement over here that when they see me, like if I said, oh, okay, I'm going to restrict to one beer a night and not drink the four that I usually drink, then I could say my wife has the ability to put the kibosh on the, mm. on the beer. You know what I'm saying? She could have the ability to, 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 and I gave her permission to do that. So there's no argument. There's no judgment when she starts to tell me. She's just doing what I ask her to do. 
David, so, as, you're, as you're going through this, I've got a, a question that kind of comes to mind and, and it may, might even come before kind of getting to this point. You'd mentioned that uh, the, in your story that uh, the managers had a list of 20 goals that they were working on. Is there something that you can share with our listeners on how to maybe prioritize those goals? Is, so you just kind of walked us through, hey, if you got a goal, this is what it is. Is there a way or a metric that you typically say, hey, this is where we want to focus on first? Well, well, if I have a list of 20 items, what I find, like, like when, when clients have a, 20, a list of 20 items, most of the time, something needs to happen before something else happens. And so when you start really looking at the list of 20 items, I want to see if one of the other items needs to come first. Mm. Okay. So the, the list is really a list of symptoms. That's correct. Usually it's a list of symptoms. That's correct because I, uh, um, Cameron, great job. Because like a lot of times what I have people do is I have a gaping wound and it's gushing out blood and they're putting a Band-Aid on it. Yeah. I don't need a Band-Aid. I need, I need a dressing. <laughs> I, I, I need this thing to heal. You know, um, the Band-Aid's not going to help me. And the Band-Aid just fixes it for that moment. In about an hour, if I don't get some real help on this thing, it's going to be gushing out blood again. And so people don't think this way when they're doing goals. They often think of like, I'll just do all 20 symptoms and it'll be fine. That's not the way it works. Man, I, I can't, yeah, I can't. I can only imagine the progress that you've been able to witness with clients when you come in and they've been kind of addressing these symptoms for years or however long and you come in and fix the problem and now all those symptoms are gone and they can actually work and, and implement systems or other, other things, other items that are more relevant to, to growth. So that would be exciting to watch. Yeah, well, one of my great stories is um, solar company out of San Diego, 22 million, 63 million, three years later. Wow. So that's, that's an exception. Um, that's not, but, but most of our clients grow probably 30 to 40% at, uh, uh, once they start to do some of this stuff because, because they're fixing these long time systemic problems yeah. that never have been addressed properly, yeah. right? So they're just painting over the rust, if you will, instead of getting the rust off. Now, the other question I have is I know you addressed a couple of, of um, some of the mistakes that kind of people make in goal settings. Uh, maybe you can address that as well. Um, some of the mistakes are um, jumping over the process and not spending time. I, I'll, I'll tell you, one of my biggest challenges when I start working with the team is they think they can whip this form out in five minutes. And this form probably needs to be worked on for about a week. Wow. Okay. I need to really put some thought into this. Like, like when did I start our, we, we have our quarters one month off of the regular quarter cycle because all of our clients are on the regular quarter cycle and it makes it impossible for us to work on our stuff. But when did I start thinking about my goals for November 1st, which is the start of our quarter? I started on October 1st. Things I was already working on, what is the next step? Then also what I'm thinking about is what are some of the things that I want to get done inside of my company that aren't, uh, that aren't making me happy? And then what are some of the things we're doing well that I need to leverage more? And, and the latter is probably the thing that people need to think about the most because too much time is spent on the second one I gave you. What did we do wrong? Wrongs could be a lot of one-offs. And I'm just fixing a one-off problem that's really not a problem. It was just a problem with one person or one customer or one client. And so I really want to get the leverage of what are the bigger items that I really need to accomplish. Awesome. Good okay. stuff. Now, wait, so you're, uh, a lot of people will start doing their goals in December, right? And then they do them in January, but you're suggesting we depending on the size of the business, you know, the, 
uh, the smaller the business, the smaller those goals should be? Like, I mean, maybe done on a monthly or quarterly basis? I, I would say to use a monthly, well, I would actually, I, uh, I would etch out some annual goals. And then what I would do, what I would do is I would, um, I would etch out some annual goals and then I would start to work backwards mm. and then figure out, I'd make a list of all the tasks that need to be done for that goal. And most likely some of those tasks are actually things that I could make monthly goals. And because uh, the term we use quite a bit is how do I eat an elephant one bite at a mm -hmm. time, right? So um, I would want to get it into bite-sized steps. What we're, what we're trying to do is work on our goals about 15 minutes to half hour a day because we have, we have clients to take care of. We have product to get out the door. We have, you know, all these other things to still do in our business. We don't have, we don't have time to spend hours and hours on a goal. But think about it. There's 21 work days in, in a month. And if I spent a half hour on that, that's 11 hours on a goal. Think about it. You could accomplish a goal in 11 hours. Yeah. Right? You'd hope, you'd hope so. Some of yep. us can. <laughs> <laughs>